Thank you, Alvin. I mean, um, I didn't expect that I, I would be introduced. I'm supposed to be here this morning to introduce our keynote speaker today, uh, Judge Suzanne Radcliffe. I know that a lot of you know her, and it's my pleasure to introduce her today. But before we get started, I'd like you to all say two little words for me just to bright up the day. It's called Hee Ha. Okay, let's do that. Hee Ha! Good. All right. So that's really is a great beginning. And um, I, 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 I attended uh, uh, Judge Radcliffe uh, and um, Becky um, session yesterday. Uh, Becky Butler over there. Uh, it was just wonderful. So. Uh, I couldn't wait until I got here to hear the other part about you know the tips from the from the judge perspective uh, on how to be a good social worker um, and so um, I couldn't even sleep last night because I was so excited and so I decided to went downstairs and swim until two o'clock. Okay, so. <laughs> Uh, but, but, uh, let me introduce her. Uh, I really like to introduce her, her as the judge for CPS. Although she said that she is no longer uh, a, an associate judge for CPS anymore for Galveston County, but I think that that image is still following her everywhere. You know, she goes. And um, when I look at her um, introduction, actually, Alvin sent me like three other emails with tons of information. I thought if I'm going to introduce this particular keynote speaker, I'm going to stand here until 10 o'clock. <laughs> and I will be spending all the time just to introduce her. So I decided not to. I only chose a few words. One is about family. And one is, of course, is about law. And um, so I thought about this. Um, my daughters, I have two daughters. My daughter has always told me that I, I always wanted to be a social worker in, the, in my household. So I always told them that, you know, this thing and that thing. And so when they were little, they, they always introduced me as a social worker of the Lungs family. <laughs> <laughs> but when, I, when they become older, now they're really old enough to be independent. Um, so my 25-year-old my one day told me, she said, Mom, you're not only the social worker in the Lung's household, you are the judge. <laughs> <laughs> I judge everything for them when they were little. Uh, <laughs> so um, the family judge image, you know, I think that uh, from Judge Radcliffe really speaks of her expertise, you know, of being practicing in the family law and mediation, and uh, the other thing that I really uh, caught my attention is she got a JD from St. Mary's University School of Law, and my second daughter is called Marie too, so it's just really, I mean, it's just kind of already in, connected me with her tremendously, okay, so not only Carol, you know, told me that I'm the judge of the Lung family, but also I connect her with my second daughter, Marie, and She's now having her own law firm, and she's practicing, and she got a lot of awards. Read her uh, uh, CV and all the things posted online. I mean, it's just a lot of things about her. And she, I mean, a couple of things that I want to mention. She got an outstanding service to children of Texas, um, and she got to also serve on the board of directors of Galveston County Bar Association. I mean, you, you can see this active person everywhere that you, you could you know think about you know that you would be helping families particularly helping children um, and one thing that um, caught my eyes is I mean you, you can go through her, her introduction uh, but caught my eye is about the psychotropic medication guidelines so I you know that's the, that's a wonderful thing you know to, to look into because it's helping children at, at CPS um, let's give us some guidelines to, to follow. So um, today her topic is about the top 10 don'ts and do's for social workers. So 
when I when I was so excited last night, you know, swimming and not everything, I thought of the top ten. What would be the top ten list that I could share with this group? I couldn't think of anything better than her topic. So I suddenly something clicked to my mind as um, you know, of course, it's about my own daughters. My two daughters, you know, when they were little, I I, I was a very strict parent. I never disciplined them in, in any other, you know, physical way. But I make sure that when I ask them to study, they study, right? <laughs> Parents, you do you do that when they study, they study. So when I caught them not studying, I would just uh, peck on their shoulder and say, wake up. <laughs> so um, when, when I caught them uh, falling asleep at their desk that they're supposed to study, the top 10 responses for my two daughters are, <laughs> or were, they're no longer little kids. So it were number 10, I have a headache, mom. <laughs> number nine, I'm sick. <laughs> number eight, I took the wrong medicine. <laughs> number, number seven, I worked late last night, mom. <laughs> and number six, I just bumped my head. <laughs> <laughs> number five, I just had jet lag, mom. I just came back from Hong Kong. <laughs> Should I study today? Okay, so number four. Did I, did I say number four? Yeah. She said, who put alcohol in my drink? <laughs> and number three, I mean, the, the last three, you know, responses that I mean, we call is, number three, Mom, didn't you also smell fungus on this table? <laughs> this group know what I mean. <laughs> number two, can you also help me Look for my contact lens. <laughs> oh, where's my contact lens? <laughs> and number one response is, they say, Amen. <laughs> so it's really, I mean, I, I couldn't think of any other better 10 top lists that from my own experience, but I think that the judge will give us very good tips. So let me. Let us welcome Judge Susan Radcliffe. Wow, thank you. I'm like whatever you are taking. <laughs> I'm just gonna do that. Can you swim till two o'clock in the morning? Wow. And I thought I was kinda hyper. I only get up and run when it's like eleven o'clock at night, but that's way after my bedtime. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm very honored to be here to, to speak with social workers. Um, I think you guys do God's work. I think y'all definitely have a place in heaven. And, you know, I always get the response where people always say, or the social workers would say, we don't get paid very much. I went to, you know, college for four years for this, and, you know, and I'm out on calls at 10 o'clock at night, and I have kids in my car that have lights, and I'm transporting drug addicts, you know, to their appointments, and everything and I just look at them I'm like you're young now but someday you will die you will go to heaven so I hope that gives you some type of comfort in that because I really do believe it um, as you heard yesterday I have a couple of disclaimers um, I'm not an expert in child abuse I don't really know what makes someone an expert it's kind of a legal term and if you've ever been on the stand before you probably heard, had the attorney come up and blah, blah, blah to the judge she's an expert he's not an expert blah 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 it's a legal term but i don't know if i would qualify as an expert in a legal proceeding but maybe i don't know um the other one is i have heard from people that i'm somewhat opinionated maybe just a little bit but i like to call it passionate and this is something that i'm very very passionate about is helping children and families you know, I kind of feel like adults without children can fend for themselves and everything, but you know, families and children, I think is what makes community, makes life, and I hopefully I've benefited some children in my years as a CPS judge. I was a CPS judge here in Galveston County for 17 years. Um, we got one of the first children's grants in Texas that kind of started specialized courts. I don't know how many of you guys have specialized courts in your um, county or your state, but this was something they got together and said, you know, we really need judges who have child abuse experience, who, um, you know, we need workers, we, we need a court where it's just 
the families and CPS. We don't need them to be in court with the jail docket and the other cases going on. We just want a specialized court. And it has also enabled me to really keep my thumb on cases and have compliance hearings constantly and really know what's going on in the case. And also the, you know, the clients in my court and the children in my court, of course. So I think it was very, very um, useful in that aspect. I was also a child abuse prosecutor for five years for the Galveston County District Attorney's Office. And during that time, I also represented CPS on the civil side. So I've done the criminal side of child abuse prosecution, and I've also done the civil side representing CPS. So I got the opportunity to be the, the, the CPS judge in 1997. So that's what I did. Now I am just a lawyer. I have a family law practice here in Houston. Um, I do mostly family law cases, um, and I do do mediations at this point. So, um, I don't know if you saw this slide up earlier about what social workers do. It's kind of funny because people probably ask you, what does a social worker do? And I mean, my favorite is Mother Teresa there, because that's what you think you do, and you do do that. Um, and I totally agree, And but you know, I'm sure you sit at your desk many, many days to do all that documentation that the federal government requires you to do, and that probably eats up a lot of your time, I'm sure, so it's probably what you do a lot of the time. Um, you know, as I said, I think you do have a place in heaven. You help children, and I like to believe at least, you know, you've helped, you know, if you can help one child, that's terrific. So I always leave the day in my courtroom going, well, maybe, maybe I couldn't help or didn't help the 20 children's cases that I heard, but you know, hopefully I helped one. Um, I'm gonna play a video for you. This um, DVD was made at one of our, um, our foster placements here in Texas. It's called the um, Hill Country Ranch. It's a great foster home, and I wish all our foster home or placements could be like this. Um, it is a group home, obviously. Um, but they also, it's out in the country, and they, really, and they specialize in finding what a child, what their specialty is, whether it's art, whether it's writing, whether it's music, maybe it's camping, maybe it's playing with animals. They really try to know the kid, and that's how they work with therapy. So what, um, the very last video I'm going to show you is this boy named um, Jacob. I think that's his name. Is it Jacob? Becky Butler is my um, technical assistant today. She usually presents with me, but I made her come today because I don't do the machine. Um, but th this boy came after being abused. Um, his brothers and sisters were, I think he had five brothers and sisters, and they were all put in different placements. And he came to this placement. He didn't say a word. He had selective mut mutism and didn't speak I mean, to anyone for about four months. And the therapist was just, you know, is pulling their hair out, how do we get this, you know, this child to speak? And they finally realized that he had a very, a huge gift for music. And he actually, from what I hear, of course he's probably 20 or something now, I did hear he had a recording um, a contract with a um, company, but I'm not sure about that. But he's very talented. So this is a video that he kind of directed and produced. Um, and you'll see him, he's the main singer in this first one that we're going to see, but he also put the other kids, he gave them a part. But this is a song that he wrote with some of the children in this placement about um, being abused and about the kind of lifestyle that they led, and it's touching. And I see this video probably I don't know, 40 times, and I, I'll cry and shake it, and it's great. So please watch this, and for anything, please stick around to the very end. I promise I won't have you here till 10, but the very last one that the boy did is just phenomenal. I mean, it'll break you down in tears, it'll make you realize, hey, I do some good stuff. Okay, so hopefully you can remember that when you're out there in the field at night and after work and working your hard hours. Um, I like to do top 10 lists because I used to love David Letterman, so hopefully you can find some amusement to this. I'm not really a comedian, but hopefully it's, you'll find it interesting. These are my personal tips. You know, do's and don'ts, whether you're testifying, maybe preparing your case. And I know you guys have a huge caseload, and it's hard to do this in every case, but um, it makes the case better, especially if you get from the DA or whoever's representing you guys that the case is going to trial. Um, first, I want to start with um, You've Come a Long Way, Baby, Virginia Slum. Um, just a real quick preview about the federal legislation. In 1997, the CPS, the child welfare system, had a big overhaul. Um, it basically came down um, from the feds to the states with different um, criteria. If you want this money for foster care or for re rehabilitation or for services, you must have these things put in your family code or in your code for child abuse cases. And the one thing that they really, really stress 
and decided that in the wisdom, this is what all the states should shoot, should, should shoot for, is reunification. And because before that it was basically, I think probably there were a lot more parental rights terminated. In 1997, the Fed said to each state, you want this money, you have to make sure in your code you can, you have to stress reunification as be part of your um, goals. In every case, there is exceptions called aggravated ex um, exceptions. I'm sure you all have them in different states. Um, but that's basically what happened. So if you were in the CPS world of child abuse world prior to 1997, this was a big, whoa, you mean I have to work with this parent and did this to their child? So it was, you know, I mean, judges were taking it back. Um, CPS workers were taking it back. I mean, I think the parents' attorneys like it. Um, but it was a big change. And people ask me, is it a good change? Yeah, I mean, it was a good change. Um, because one thing I have learned through 17 years is um, there's really no better place for a child than with their parents or relative. Um, and I think that came full, that was full circle for me. When I was at the DA's office, I did a lot of parental terminations. Um, kind of, you know, was very anti-parent in a way because I was prosecuting them and I had the CPS case. Um, got on the bench, um, you know, I used to think, God, foster parents, Foster um, care has got to be better than this child's home. But, you know, we I don't know about what state you're from, but we've had a lot of problems with our foster care system. I mean, I've had children abused in foster care. Um, I've had um, a child tell me that, you know, he, you know, he only gets a piece of bread with butter on it a day. And this is, uh, you know, these people are getting, I call it getting paid to raise this child. It's tax-free money, it's our money going to this you know, um, placement, and you know, that person wasn't even feeding the child. So I've heard a lot of nightmare stories, and not to mention the fact that kids just want to be home. They want to be in their community. They want to be with their siblings. They want to be with an aunt, uncle, grandmother, grandfather, whoever that may be. So if you're not reunifying with a parent, the goal is reunifying with the family members. And I think we've come a long way in doing that because before we didn't even look for family members. It was like, okay, you're a bad parent, we don't know where dad is, we're terminating putting them in foster care. And you hope it's a great foster care, and then you hope that they'll be adopted. In Texas, I don't know what the US statistics are, but if a child is not adopted by eight years old, your chances of being adopted are like, I don't know, I think adoption is 12%. So if you're not, you know, those children aren't getting adopted, they're sitting in foster care, usually a group home. And you know, we don't like to use the word orphanage, because that's, you know, a bad word, but I don't know about all states, but they're orphanages. <laughs> And they're in their big, you know, buildings. A lot of the group homes, and some of them don't get the one-on-one -on -one care that these families that can give them. So I went full circle with that. So that's kind of the legislation. That's where we are, and I think it's a good thing. I do see a lot of repeat. I call them repeat offenders because I think maybe we rushed to give them their children back when they weren't quite ready because we have a year guideline deadline. And so I've seen a lot of. I saw a lot of repeat offenders, but. And then I was kind of like, look, you've been down this drill, we gotta work with you again. Um, we gotta give you another family service plan. Uh, can you imagine the workers are like, oh my God, I just got rid of this case seven months ago, now they're back with me. Um, so we give them the same services, but um, hopefully it, they learn something from it. So my top 10 do's and don'ts, these are just my um, opinion about things, is my first one is to make sure you articulate your position, and remember, your position is CPS's or your eight, whatever agency you work for. That's the position. So you don't get to stand up there as an individual and get to give your you know, opinion per se. You're really speaking on behalf of your agency, whatever that agency may be. So I want to say, make sure you talk with your supervisor. I mean, I'm Galveston County. The supervisor that should go to court. They sit in the back um, usually, and you're going. <sighs> You know, so I'm like, I want to go take a break and talk, and they will. And so I would say, do all that before court. Make sure your supervisor is updated on your case, and make sure that they know. Um, hey, I think the judge is going to be asking, when can this child go home? Because you need to be able to answer that. Um, so don't say, oh, this is my favorite. I have to get my supervisor, or we have to staff this. <laughs> oh my God, you should drive me crazy. I'm thinking to myself, you knew this court hearing was, you know, said. What do you mean now you're staffing the case? And one thing that defense attorneys or parents attorneys really grill the social worker on stand about is, you haven't staffed this case yet. Really, you're going to stand up here and say this kid can't go, can't go home because the case has not been staffed. So make sure it's um, staffed. And if you do all this, you're not going to be a deer in the headlights. You're going to be prepared, and you're going to be confident, and you're going to know your case. And I think that's all judges 
juries really expect that you know your case. Are you right all the time? No. I mean, you know, it, is it, are judges right all the time? They think they are, but um, they're not. And so it's just, you know, you have to um, use your best um, opinion and your best investigation skills and remember what's in the best, best interest of the child. That's a federally mandated standard that all the states have. So I would say, you know, as a catch-all, as someone asks you a question, you know, you believe this to be true, you just to say it's in the best interest of the child. And really, it's kind of like a catch-all phrase, and I don't think the defense attorneys can really um, say too much about that. Okay, number two. Tell the parents the truth. Okay, if, you know, at the beginning, you know, they had their, their family service plan, and y'all probably, I don't know if y'all call them in other states, but that plan at the beginning of the case, telling the parents exactly what they need to do, and they sign it, and they say, yeah, I understand that if I don't do these things, I probably won't get my kids back. It's a warning, that the federal warning we have to give the, the parents. Make sure that, you know, they know that this is what they need to do. Now, don't come to court seven months later and go, oh, we, yeah, mom said everything, but you know what? She didn't go take that, you know, CPR class. Well, um, okay, why well, wasn't that given, you know, suggestion given to her early on in the case? To me, it creates delays. Um, so just make sure you know what that parent needs to do up front and tell them. And if, you, and if it's aggravated or you think it's so bad and you're like, Miss Smith, you've been in here, you know, your other eight kids are in care, your other, your rights have been terminated to the other eight children, I'm not going to recommend the judge that you get your kids back. Tell them that. Say, there's really nothing that you can do because of your past history. And, um, you yeah, know, just be truthful with them. I think they appreciate that. And you know what? And I and I say this, you know, to everyone. And I say to the, you know, the parents and the attorneys. It's always the judge's decision. Blame it on the judge. That mean judge. That mean judge won't let you go home. That mean judge won't let your parents see. That mean judge. I mean, blame it on the judge. Okay. Um, I have funny. I mean, kids come up to me. I mean, they say the funniest things. I talk to them in chambers. And I love talking to children. And they, you know, the first thing I get is, you know, like that mean. So I have a feeling, you know, that the attorneys are probably saying that mean judge, but that's the first thing that I get. But I love talking to children. Okay. Number three, I want to make sure that you know what the child's therapist recommendations are, you know, before you get into court. Because I, as a judge, you know, that's, I, I know what you say or what you're thinking. What, I can read your report. What does that therapist say? How well is that child progressing? Have we started at point A and are we at C now? Um, where, where, where are we in that child's therapy? And I can't tell you, the, I mean, the biggest mistake CPS workers made in, my, made in my court were they didn't know, well, I haven't talked to the therapist, or he, she won't call me back. This is y'all's employer. Like CPS, y'all contract with them, y'all pay them. When I say y'all, you know, CPS or our tax dollars, I mean, they're paid. So when they don't call you back, you need to go to your supervisor or go to your program director and say, I've been trying to call this therapist and they won't call me back. They need to call you back. Frankly, I think our contracts require them to do a monthly progress report to the um, workers. Now, do they all do them, Becky? So, if he, to me, I'm like, so when their contract is up the next year, why well, these people still getting contracts? But anyway, there should be a monthly progress report given to you as a worker. Um, now, remember, this is it's all about the child, not the parent. So, you need to know what's in the child's best interest, and part of that is what you know what what is happening in therapy. And it just looks to me really unprofessional when the defense attorney is grilling the person on the stand. If you haven't talked to the therapist, you didn't get the school records, you haven't looked at the school records to determine that Johnny was doing the same thing he was doing in foster care. I mean, because it must not be the parent's fault, you know, I mean, it, it just looks really bad. So, you know, make sure you have the school records, you talk to the child's therapist. And this is important, I'm gonna add this. Make sure that therapist has a copy of the affidavit. And the affidavit that brought that, that the children into care. I mean, I'm sure all the states have them. You know that you have. You get your probable cause. You go pick up the child, or take the child from the home. That therapist needs that affidavit to know what that child has allegedly been going through in, in the, his or her home. So without it, I think therapists can be kind of lost. It kind of gives them direction. This goes back to kind of the same thing. I mean, this is your case, and believe me, I know you guys have 200 kids under your care, and I know you guys have, you know, 25, what's, what's the case limit now? Didn't they mandate, isn't that federally mandated now? They don't really have, Texas, I think, the 25 cases? No. Supposedly, you're supposed to be, or, I'm sorry, I spoke in front of the legislature, and they think y'all only have 25 cases, and I was like, 
anyway, that's 25 cases, and some of those cases might have eight children. So that's not how many children you have, that's the cases. So, and I know, I know it's hard for y'all, but when you're on the stand, you know, that defense attorney and that jury is going, we don't care about your other, you know, 900 kids. We want to know about this kid. So make sure you know your case, you know the history. Even though you weren't the investigator, know what that investigation was about. Because how are you going to reunify and see if the family can work together and, and, you know, without abuse and neglect if you didn't know what the problem was to begin with? And you don't know how many foster care workers, um, sub care workers come to my court. Because I don't really see the investigators because um, we do a mediation at the beginning. So I didn't really see the first case. So I didn't see the investigators that much. But you would be surprised at how many sub care workers didn't really know why that child was in care or didn't know the history of that child being in care or mom or dad's history. So I would just say know your case. Um, why? Because you know what? That defense attorney or parent's attorney, they're going to ask you that. That's what they're going to want to know. And remember, their job is to put up the smoke screen and make you look stupid. Just remember that. So you don't want to look stupid to know your case, and that's the way you don't look stupid. Okay, next. Okay, be prepared. This is, this, you know, I, I didn't really number these in any order, but um, you know what? Bring a pen and paper to court. I don't expect, and bring your case file, or at least bring notes from your case file. I don't expect you guys to stand in front of me and know in December this happened, and March this happened, you know what I mean? No one would know that. You don't need to memorize it, but bring a summary of what's been going on in the case. And when I'm, well, when I was on the bench telling the CPS worker, okay, I want this, that, whatever, for the child or for the parent, and you're standing there like this, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I'm thinking to myself, Wow, you must have a really good memory. It's like when you go to that restaurant, you know, they think it's really impressive because they don't write down your order, <laughs> and then they bring it to you and it's all wrong. Right. You should have written it down. It's okay to write things down. And I think it looks good to the, you know, it makes you, I mean, look at when I say fake it, kind of bring a pen and paper and, and doodle. Yes, judge. Yes. I mean, <laughs> pretend, okay? Because the next time you come to court, you know, I'm going to ask you, the judge is going to ask you, did you make that, you know, referral? Did you do that for the parent or the child or whatever? Um, so that's, you know, my number one thing. Okay, this is a little thing that Becky found. She wanted to throw this in. I thought it was cute. She's, oh my God, social workers are going to love this. <laughs> and then a genogram, right? Woo! <laughs> and what, what Becky says in social work, um, she's got her um, master's in social work. And she goes, oh my God, Jenny Graham, I want to hear her see that again. <laughs> Apparently it's like a big thing, you know. Um, but I thought that was cute. <laughs> Becky found that, so she gets credit for that. Okay, um, the next thing is document, document, document. Um, you know what? Parents will have amnesia when they come to court, and the first thing out of their mouth is always, my worker never told me that, you know. And, you know, and they'll say, I'll call my worker, you know, 20 times this week, and my next question is, really, what's your phone number? <gasps> oh, well, I have it in my phone. And I'm like, if you can't really, what, what are the first three numbers? Mm, well, I don't know. But if, if you as a social worker, if you're documenting, I talked to, you know, Ms. Smith on the phone today, you know, about going to her drug rehab classes. Or Ms. Smith called me about getting a ride, I called her back and she said, no, I don't need a ride. Just, I mean, just document, you know, your um, communication. And if it's something really important that you want that parent to know, and you know, get out a piece of paper from your pen or from your pad, and when you're in their house or whatever, and write it down and have them initial it. And you know what? That's legal. I have people go, that's not a legal document. That's not going to hold up in court. Yes, it will. Okay? Yes, it will. It doesn't have to be on a formal piece of paper or notarized by a notary or anything. So, you know, if you're thinking, God, she's not going to know this or remember this or she's going to say it and tell her, Rip it out, have them sign it, initial it, or whatever, and then admit that to evidence. Give that to your attorney and say, "Here you go, just for your for your um, file." Okay, um, this kind of goes with knowing what's going on with the therapist, but it's not only the child's therapist, the parents' therapist. Um, know how the parents progressing, because remember, we're trying to rehab, rehabilitate this parent or caregiver to to put the child back home. So we have a fragmented family we're trying to put back together. And if you don't know the progress of that parent, like what they needed to work on, you know, or how they're doing, how they're doing on those progresses, then I, I as a judge, or the, you know, um, I can't make a very good decision about that. So, and I always ask, okay, well, what did mom's therapist say? 
And I always love it when the mom or dad's therapist says, oh, you know, those kids need to come home, blah, 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 and you know. And, but no, it's not really up to them, it's the child's therapist. And you know, I've heard so many things from corporate parents. Like, you know, I had, I had one woman who started, well, I started the DA's office in 1990, and so I think I terminated four of her children at that point. By the time, and then I got on the bench and she had 10 more, so she had 14 children with the same guy, which was impressive, okay? Same man, that she's monogamous. Um, Y'all know who we're talking about, right? I mean, that was back in my day, a long time ago. And you know, and I was just like, you know, why do you think I should give you this, you know, these children back? You know, because they're mine, okay? And you know, what kind of things have you done to make your life better? I don't have to make. God gave them to me; they're mine. And you know, if you take these, I'm gonna have more. It's basically what she told us. And um, I don't know if she's still having kids. Is she good? Um, so anyway, she kind of felt that way. You take these kids. I'm gonna, you know, have more. And she, her kids' names were like Miracle and Sunshine and Destiny and, you know, all these like futuristic, which were great, you know. And I wish she would have rebuilded herself and provided for her children, but she just never really could. But good enough, she's not having. And she's young. Oh, God, I bet you she's only 45, so she could probably have some more children. Watch out. Okay, next one. <laughs> Communication. Um, this just kind of goes back with. You know, communicate to all the parties. A lot of times, um, CPS forgets to talk to the children's attorney or to CASA. I don't know if y'all have CASA. That's those are court-appointed special advocates. And a lot of times, I know. I mean, they kind of forget to tell them what's going on in the case or to include them on an email or a letter. So I just say, make sure you communicate um, and make sure if you have an agreement as far as termination or not termination that the you know the obviously the child's attorney and the um, child. Um, advocate needs to know that needs to sign off on it so just communicate okay next thing was my kind of pet peeve we have a um, system in Galveston County um, it's called a um, what do they call it a task force we just call it a CRT uh, a community review team okay community re um, review team case review team case review team so when, when a crime allegedly happens um, CPS and police officers and the district attorney's office, they staff these cases and they kind of determine, well, the, you know, fall charges, we need this done, or whatever, to kind of just kind of build the case. And the CPS is involved. It might not be the worker in front of me, but CPS as an agency involved. And so my, one of my worst pet, pet peeves was, I don't know what the status of the criminal case is. And I'm like, well, the man's in jail for sexually, or allegedly sexually abusing this child. And we're going on our ninth month here, you know, um, how's mom doing, what's going on? What if, it, well, mom's been staying away from him, yeah, because he's been in jail. Um, what's gonna happen when he gets out? Have y'all checked, where's he gonna go? I mean, you know, have you really made plans to separate? What's going on? Have you talked to the DA? If I give these kids back, is that DA gonna go in and prosecute that case in front of a jury? Because you know what the first thing that defense attorney's gonna say? Oh, this is such a horrible case that you gave the kids back. To Mr. Johnson or whatever, and that's okay if you do that. But I'm just like, let's get on the same team, kind of get an update. Now, do you do you guys have a pretty good relationship with who the prosecutor is in your county about else cases in general? No. Yes. She's saying that it takes so long to get indicted or to, to, for the criminal case to go through, and that is true. And that's one thing if you ever go to determination that the defense attorney really grills you on is like, well, this person hasn't even been indicted, but at least you'll have a status. You can say, judge, you know, it's still under, you know, under investigation or still you know, going to be indicted or whatever the, whatever the progress is. I'm not saying you're going to call the DA and say, get this case done, because they won't. But there's also an exception in our code for a continuance of the, um, of the year if someone's in jail. So you can ask for that continuance. Actually, it's mandatory. Thank goodness a lot of the parents' attorneys don't know about it, because they, they don't ask for it. But if they ask for it, the judge has to grant it. So and that can take, you know, that can take a long time when that kid's lingering in foster care. OK. Okay, most, most, most importantly, um, it's best interest of the child. That's federally mandated, they have it, um, and they might, they word it differently in different um, states, but it's best interest of the child. And that's what it's all about. 
So it's not about the parent who said that their kid's not home, they want their kid back, I'm sorry. You know, it's about that child. And it's really important to, you know, to be the voice of the child, because in a way you are, you know, I mean, you have to you get out there and advocate for the child's best interest. And if that's returning the child back to that home, that's fine, you know? I mean, or if it's, you know, leaving the child with grandma, fine. Leaving the child in foster care, that's fine. But remember, it's a child's best interest. And you're gonna get that by talking to the therapist, talking to the foster care, I mean, to the foster care placement, to the school where the child is now, um, and to see what's going on. And you know what? It, it's, your, it's your words. Don't be scared. Oh my God, the defense attorney, you know, and they, you know they're going to try to twist your words and all that. And if you just remember in the back of your mind, best interest, best interest of the child. No, Mr. Smith, I don't think it's in the best interest of John to go home now. Or, you know, whatever you say. Um, and just keep, be, and be confident in that. Because, you know, my favorite thing is the expert. When the defense attorney does not like what you say, oh my God, Judge, she or he's not an expert. You know, I'm going to try to get their testimony out. But if they like what you say, you're an expert. And I know you're just kind of walking like, oh my God, you know, walking that line. But if you if you just stay um, confident in, you, in your in your words and always stay on the same page, then I think that's hard for the defense attorneys to throw you. And I know how scared it scared it is to get on the um, stand and testify. I mean, I've done, I've done it before, and I'm in this Galveston fracas right now, and I'll probably be testifying in a criminal case because I'm a complaining witness right now. You can Google it if, you, if you're curious. It's very scary what's going on. But, and, and it's scary. I mean, it's, it's, I had to go testify. <laughs> I've testified in front of grand juries before, and it's, it's, it's scary. And it's like swimming with sharks or swimming with alligators or walking on a landmine. But I, you know, I keep saying, well, you had, in order to get from this side to that side, you got to do it. <laughs> So you gotta, you know, jump in and you gotta swim or whatever because that's the only way you're gonna get the case point, the case apart, um, to the jury or to the judge and to hopefully save that child. So um, now this is my y'all probably have heard the story for story a hundred times, but this is a this is just a synopsis. And I found this when I first started doing child abuse cases, and it just always and I would keep it in my desk and read it when I would get discouraged because. You know, you think, oh my God, you know, I have all these cases. Am I helping anybody? I mean, y'all get just discouraged, like, you know, am I even doing anything for anyone? I feel like I'm just spinning my wheels. And I mean, the starfish, the about this little boy who kept picking up starfish after a storm on the beach, and he kept throwing them back in the water, and the man goes, son, you know, you're crazy. What are you doing? You can't save all the starfish. And the little boy goes, yeah, but I can at least save one. So I would keep that in my desk, so I would highly suggest you guys get that, get it, put it in your desk, tape it on your wall, on your bulletin board or whatever, because you know what, you're gonna save one child and then you're gonna go to heaven. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay, I'm probably, oh, I'm way, I'm way out of time, but y'all are probably glad, right? Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show this last video. Um, this is Jacob, this is the guy who kind of produced all those. Um, it's fabulous, it makes me cry every time I watch it, but um, it kind of says it all. About all children want is to be loved, to be safe, to have food and education. And you know what, I always tell people, all kids want to go home, that's all they want to do. And this is a child that was mute for six months or four months with this therapist. And they finally got him to talk, and he finally just said, he's so angry at his mom, anger, you know, and the therapist said, you know, you just got to figure out a way to get over this, because you're never, ever going to, you know, go on in life until you get rid of this anger, you know, and so he finally found something, and um, he sings about it, so. Come get him and his sister and his baby sister and brothers. And they had been in care before. I don't, you know, they all they were all spread out. I don't know what happened. Um, he's older. This is an older video. But can you imagine having to call the police on your mom or dad because they can't take care of you know their siblings? So I mean, I guess the point was he just you know he he went through this. He worked through it, and he just wanted to let the mom know that he's going to work through it and he forgave her. So keep that in mind. Um, I, as a judge, also, my parents, I'm a big believer in watching videos, this kind of stuff. So if when drug cases came in my court, I would make them watch this a lot of times and write me a report on how that makes them feel. And, and you know, we hope that it would help them. But I got some good reports after watching this. So um, we're going to end early. I know y'all are upset because it's the last day. You know, I'm dying to get out. I've been to many conferences.